Hey guys, Jason here, Master Jace for the Alliance Project, the Rebel Alliance. Um, today we're going to talk about the pyramids. Uh, I was going to finish the Emerald Tablets, but for some reason uh, my video is blocked in 246 countries and I disputed it and I'm seeing why. Um, one wasn't blocked, three wasn't blocked, but two was. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on there before I finish the project so people can actually pay attention to it and carry on and... Uh, synchronicity that they're supposed to. But um, today we're gonna work, talk about um, how the pyramids worked, what they were, and how they produced energy. So a lot of ancient Egypt's um, yet to be discovered. Uh, if you look at satellite images, you can see traces and of structures that are buried underneath the sand that still aren't excavated. And in the name of protecting sites, they basically are keeping us from understanding the truth about our ancient past. Um, the best way to describe it is when you just look at the security they got, they got a hundred armed guards at night. Uh, there's a 20 foot wall all the way around the whole plateau and just routine investigations are turned down almost instantly every time so there's definitely more to the picture than they want us to see or let us know um, despite regulations on what kind of investigation goes on there's still an enormous amount of evidence if you just look in plain sight to see what was going on and what it was um, we don't have the technology to, to build the pyramids today not even close um, when people, they kind of get arrogant and they don't understand that we aren't as technologically advanced or as smart as we once were. And people have a hard time grasping or understanding that, like I said, through arrogance, almost through ignorance, if you will, not knowing. Um, but they were, they were far more advanced than us in almost every way. So scholars say that men and women with ropes and animals and logs pulled these 60 to 200 ton blocks, 500 miles, shaped them perfectly and placed them perfectly, especially the outside stones. And I'll get to that in a moment, why the outside stones are so precise compared to the, uh, the ones on the inside. And it's just wrong. There's, there's no way we could do it. We could, we could take a couple cranes, probably like three or four cranes, and lift some of these 200 ton blocks, but we could only lift them straight up and down. <laughs> There's not much else we could do with them. So Egyptologists insist that it was built by slaves to feed the egos of kings. But there was no slavery at the time. There were no slaves whatsoever in Egypt. I'm pretty sure they, they were all free men and women, and they were doing coming together for this group project because of the outcome they knew there was um a very good payoff in the end uh you have to think of our largest structures that we built like um hydroelectric dams we get a enormous payoff and it gives us power to feed our technology and ourselves and along with other things so the idea of constructing something like this has to be functional just when you understand the, the sheer scale and effort took to create these things. They were all willingly a part of this. They were pyramid builders. They were, they were able to build these because they wanted to build them. They, they were a part of this and they were definitely qualified with the architecture and engineering that was needed to just complete something like this. One of the amazing examples of uh, high technology in ancient Egypt is the Baghdad battery. It can uh, it conducted an electrical charge enough to power a light bulb, and we've replicated them, and they indeed do create an electrical current. Um, when you go into the the places inside the temples and the inside the pyramids, there was no ash or um any remnants of a torch or oil lamps being used. So they had to have some kind of light source in there. 
And when you just look at the hieroglyphs, you see that they had things that looked like modern light bulbs to us. So most Egyptologists and mainstream scientists, I guess you could say, uh, considered them tombs and nothing else. But if you just look at the simple fact that there's no mummies in the tombs or in the pyramids, then that rules that out. Also, the scale of the project for a tomb is just ridiculous. Uh, they had step pyramids and things that weren't like the Great Pyramids of Giza that were tombs and did house mummies, but the Great Pyramids and the Great Pyramid itself did not house any mummies. So it was not a tomb. It was not a tomb for the uh, Khufu. So one way to look at it is the older structures were made of larger stones. Newer construction was made with smaller stones. The older construction was deeper and the newer construction was closer to the surface. Um, it was the same with the, the Incas and everything else. The Incas a troop, or get attributed to these megalithic, huge stone structures. But if you just take a look, you can see the difference. And I'll show you here in a few moments um, some examples of where they actually added on to these structures that were already existing. So the ones that were tombs, like the one in Saqqara, the step pyramids, the insides were decorated with hieroglyphs um, saying the person's name, stating who was buried there and things like that. The inside the Great Pyramid was purely functional. The walls, everything, they were, it was a machine. There was no hieroglyphs except in certain, very certain specific spots. So if you ask yourself the simple thing, if they weren't tombs, what were they? Then you got to look at modern man, like I said. And the largest things we build today are hydroelectric dams. So if you wonder why we would take the effort to get such an awe-inspiring feat of engineering and architecture, it's because we know we get a very real and tangible payoff in the form of electricity. So common sense would say that with the smaller population and these greater engineering feats that they were so willing to put the resources into it because they knew they were going to get a payoff that was worth it in the form of electricity and energies of different types. So where we pick up is um, you understand there's they had a higher understanding of something that we're just now dabbling with and it's called subtle energy so they very much knew and completely understood these subtle energies which involve electromagnetism ionization and you know magnetism all the whole earth force they understood the whys and the laws of nature and through that they manipulated it to create energy I don't mean by any means to say that this was the only purpose to create these subtle energies, but it definitely seems like you could motivate a whole society to take on these feats when you consider that they would get a very real payoff in return. Now these megalithic structures they exist all around the world and they seem to make these different types of formations, circles, triangles, pyramids, things like that. And one thing they all have in common is they're on ley lines. Um, most of them at places where they intersect. So these ley lines, um, the, the sacred sites were placed on these ley lines where basically the geological energy where the electromagnetic and all these different types of energy were ignited in a grid through the sun every day. Um, the places were kind of concentrated there like a vortex, um, a place where they cross. These ley lines carry the energy across the land. These um, they call it, they call it tellura currents, and it these it's like an energy grid, and it carries that across these lines. And we know that this ley energy, this subtle energy, is carried across these lines. And there's certain types of geological geological formations that help amplify or carry this energy, you know, tenfold. For um, terminology, it's called conductivity discontinuities. Sounds a little complicated, but it's not. It basically just means one place of the Earth that has the natural ability to conduct this, this electricity or this energy meets another place that doesn't have the same, uh, I guess you say, potency or 
efficiency of carrying out this energy. Um, the Chinese had the same tradition. They were called dragon lines, and it was illegal for a commoner to be buried on these lines. Kings had to be buried on these lines. They put palaces there, um, temples, lots of sacred sites. And all around the world, these megalithic structures, meaning these people that built with large stones, have them built on these lines, especially where they intersect. They placed them there as almost markers so people could come and travel to there to get more healthy energy from the earth and be healed by these energies and also help enhance their natural frequency and well-being. So it appears that they were attempting to control this energy and use this energy for their own purposes. Now, the best time to study these things are the three dawn hours, right before the sun rises. And it's because it has to do with the natural changes in the Earth's geomagnetic fields. So it's strongest at the day, weakest at night, and the hours leading up to that change are, is the biggest time where you can see the, the change in the sensitivity of the instruments using to measure this kind of energy um, fluctuate the most. So it's basically the most dramatic change in the, the magnetic strength in these weaker lines as they, they roar to life as the sun touched them. So when you have a changing magnetic field, you're generating electricity and anything that'll conduct electricity. Anything that'll conduct electric current, you're generating electricity through just changing the magnetic field. Um, it's a simple principle of physics known as induction. And if you guys would like to learn more about it, just look up induction. Um, most of the time, these places, they occur at mountaintops or temples, things like that. You'll feel a uh, calming peacefulness. Some people have religious experiences or mystical experiences at these places. Some people claim to see into other dimensions or into some other times. Um, the Chinese have known, it, known about this for some time, and they call it chi, chi force. Um, the Indians called it prana. Star Wars called it the force. And since it affects electricity and magnetics, it actually affects all the other laws of physics. So these ancient megalithic builders um, understood this energy and engineered their sacred sites to further concentrate this energy. So we're not used to things being built out of stone, being considered high technology. But if you just look at the basic structure of the pyramids, we realize that they're made out of a different variety of stones called in and quarried from different places of the world for their core elements that they had a part of their, their, just their makeup, essentially. We'll get into that right now. Now, if you're looking at the Great Pyramids, the Great Pyramid, um, it's made up of a certain kind of stone that's called dolomite. It's a certain type of lime, limestone. It has a high magnesium content, so it conducts electricity really well. And then they shelled it, and this Torah limestone that's whiter and prettier looking, um, and it has no little to no magnesium content, so it's more of an insulator. It's almost uh, a pure calcium carbonate, which basically all limestone is made out of. And if you consider that they shelled it with that, the outer stones, and when you look at just the evidence left behind, these outer stones were cut so much more precisely, so much closer, and that's for a purpose. So we have a highly conductive core wrapped in a good insulator, basically, okay? And they also lined the passageways, these open places that actually touch the air, with granite. And granite is slightly radioactive. So it, so it will electrify or ionize the air. It releases um, what we call radon gas. So it's granite's basically a transmission stone. It's not a dead stone. It's an alive stone. It conducts electricity very well and ionizes the air around it. So we have these sealed shafts lined with granite. And one would think just from an electrical standpoint that they kept it there and did that. And so these shafts to keep an electrical charge in those shafts. Basically, they were built like an insulated wire. But um, let's, let's see if I can pull up uh, an example of that real quick for you. So basically, this is the same um, idea that they used for the pyramids. They had an insulator on the outside the conductive stone and then layers of insulator and a highly conductive electrical charge in the center where these cham chambers were, the uh, 
Grant was ionizing the air and keeping an electrical charge in it. So they had it spread across the base that had all this electrical charge and then had these arcane angles that essentially concentrated all the energy to one point at the top. So here's a good example of that. Um, and we'll get into the aquifers and the land essentially, but same idea. You had a ground, you had a tower, and Tesla did the same thing with Ward Wardenclyffe Tower and how he wirelessly transmitted electricity and different types of energy. Um, all this was concentrated, the energy, to a point at the top of the pyramid, the capstone. So we find similarities in three different constructions. Um, the Valley Temple, the one built at Abydos, and Stonehenge in England. They were using the same materials and the same kind of locations where these ley lines intersected, and also they um, had something underneath, which was an aquifer. So they have these limestone aquifers underneath these sacred sites. Um, an aquifer is an underground cavern system of porous um, water-filled rock, basically. And water traveling through just from, say, the flood season or rainfall, as the water flies flows through these limestone or these chalk aquifers, it actually produces electrical charge. And you can actually measure this, the, the increase in the ground current or the change in the magnetic field as these things happen, as the water flows through these aquifers. In Egypt, you had the, the Nile River, it would flood and then drop every year. And that dropping and raising and the water moving through these aquifers and limestone would generate an electrical charge. Flowing water itself generates a mild electrical charge. You can take um, the old science test where you take your faucet and you split the, the, the water and put a LED light there with its two uh, wires and about every eight seconds or so it would light up, have enough charge to light up the bulb, and make a flash in the LED, which means it generates an electric current, which means it generates a magnetic field too. Even at the sacred site in Tiwanaku, they had their most sacred site. They had uh, it was terraced in a way to allow water to to fall almost constantly. So, long story short, the rising falling of the Nile River would produce this electrical ground current that would help power or boost the energy in the pyramid. So that's why the the ionized air in these granite shafts and stuff would be there pro um, there to help keep the process going. That way, if the water rising and falling or was not there, you know, it wasn't flood season or things like that, there was a drought, then this, this process would still main, be maintained. The idea is, is like uh, the aquifer is your, um, your alternator and the, the ducts of the, the pyramid were kind of like your battery. So when the car's not running, the alternator's not moving. The battery is what keeps the charge. So you have this concentration of negative charge, this ground charge below it, and a concentration of the positive charge above it. And if the two become strong enough, then you get what's called brush discharge. It would actually glow or sparkle. A um, good example is ball lightning. So this invisible subtle energy is around us all the time, and it's actually measurable by science. So it's not a theory. So if you actually look at a lot of um, amateur photography of the pyramids and these sacred sites, you'll see a lot of these little orbs and glowing balls in them, these little balls of light. And it's usually in flash photos, so something taken at night or just with a flash. So some of the ones in South America that they call dead pyramids because there's no electrical charge going on. Um, if you take photography and flash photography there, you'd never, you know, you'd never see the orbs. But on the ones that are about 1,200 years older, the most ancient of the sites there, um, they take flash photography and they would get a lot of the orbs glowing and things like that. And it seems that most of them happen, and you get a lot of these orbs at, um, at the time of day when the electrical charge in the air is at its highest point. And they've actually recorded a higher electrical charge at those certain times that are actually higher than thunderstorms, the, the electrical charge in the air during a thunderstorm. We don't really know what orbs are, but the best guess is they're um, balls of ionized air that kind of pocket and cling together. 
basically saying that it was so electrified that the molecules in it are excited enough to glow. So one of the great minds that did this work was uh, Nikola Tesla. He discovered that electrical current was constant and it was always in you know the air and the ground of the earth basically the atmosphere and the ground current the telluric currents that are present in the ground and the electrical currents that are in the ionosphere which of course is ionized by the sun he created and developed ways to harness this energy and was funded by jp morgan um when J.P. Morgan found out that he wanted and thought that electricity should be free to everybody, then J.P. Morgan pulled the funding. Even after he was a, should, gave examples of him being able to light bulbs wirelessly and conduct electricity wirelessly and harmlessly, um, J.P. Morgan didn't want to have anything to do with it because there'd be no way to charge people. So after that point, all electrical study was done through wires. So basically... A lot of the energy we have now is um, from what we call explosion energy. But the sound energy, this um, natural current of energy, is more of an implosion energy, if you guys want to research that a little bit more. The explosion energy leaves exhaust and pollution and is created by you know, combustion most of the time. Um, implosion energy is renewable and clean. It doesn't have any kind of exhaust. So implosion energy like solar power and, um, you know, hydroelectricity, these turning of turbines is clean and renewable. Um, it's sustainable energy. It's the same as solar energy. We need this kind of new, renewable, sustainable energy. And um, coming to the realization that we already had it is kind of mind-blowing when you think about it, um, considering the state of the world today. Implosion energy, basically all you need is a beam of light from the sun hitting running water that's going in a zigzag. Um, in addition to the aquifers underneath the pyramids, there's uh, a lot of evidence and proof that there's man-made tunnels there that go in like a honeycomb zigzagging effect. And every so often they'll have places where light is, uh, there's top of the caverns missing so the light can come down and ionize the water, making an electrical charge. So there's, there's many, many openings that permits the sun's light to hit these tunnels, which remain made, that help also boost and produce this energy. And it's not just the type of energy that you can use to you know, run your car, turn a light on, it's actually there to heal and feel and sustain people. So in the 1880s, um, a man named Siemens standing on top of the pyramid and him and his guide they, they noticed that when he spread his fingers they would hear a ringing in his ear and when he touched them together it would stop so what they did was take a, a latent jar which was um, a way that they stored electricity back then and it was basically a wine bottle with wet newspaper that was wrapped around it and he held it above his head and until start, sparks started to fly um, they accused him of witchcraft and sorcery things like that and they got in a little altercation. He actually touched uh, one of the guides with the wine bottle and the charge discharged into his body, knocking him unconscious and throwing him to the ground for a short period of time. So there's an example of a scientist that understood electrical nature of things, even in its like rudimentary development process. Um, having an example of this energy that was created by the pyramids, even with their uninsulated outside and the casing shells knocked off, still produces energy, just not at the levels that it was. So they have this thing called the schist disc that was found in a tomb that people aren't allowed to access anymore. They aren't allowed to go in there at all. And it was completely out of context for the room and the findings of the room. And it looks like a machined uh, propeller almost that could, could almost like hold water. And they found, um, core samples like core drills, uh, the part that actually comes out the core that seem to fit perfectly with this schist disc as the rod. So just to shape and machine these things, you'd have to have a high level of technology and precision. But this is actually a tube. It's like a rock. It looks like a pipe. You know, the inside's core center, um, poured out and then the outside's done. And the only way you could actually do this is by using diamonds, not bronze chisels and stone hammers. 
And I'm going to go ahead and share with you a little um, awesome little finding of these quartz crystal uh, shaped objects. So let me pull that up. So as, as they said there, quartz crystals is basically they use oscillating electrical currents to store massive amounts of energy and data and it's alive and everything that you're using to watch right now, your cell phone, your computer screen, your ethernet cable, everything, every piece of technology uses quartz crystals and this oscillating electricity. In Egypt alone, there's 67 different structures alongside the Nile or where the Nile used to be that if you have the eye for it, you can tell that it was made to conduct these different or produce these different types of um, energy. So in theory that since they're making all these different types of energy, energy, they, they thought, and people think to this day, a lot of the top scholars think that they was actually used to actually spiritualize or keep a higher level of conscious for these uh, people that live there to keep them from falling into the dark ages. And if you look into the Yugi cycles and the fall of man and the rise of man, the ages, um, it coincides with this perfectly. Um, it seems like a deterrent to keep people from falling into a barbar barbaric state, which we were in all around the world. Um, Cool thing is, is we're coming out of that now and we're coming into, you know, the age of enlightenment where we start to gain access to these higher frequencies and higher levels of consciousness just from our natural placement in the galaxy. So it's a wonderful time, but there's also a great falling away. You know, it's that we're at Earth is just being treated like crap. People are very rude and ignorant. They, they don't think much beyond their face or their screen and those of us that do we we seem to connect and talk and theorize and start to learn about these hidden technologies and knowledge that is wasn't present but is now present you know it is uh we're rediscovering history and for those of us that are interested in this stuff it's probably part of your mission to help you know raise the consciousness and the level of awareness in humanity now um i have plenty of more examples i'd like to go over but uh, i'm going to try to knock out a couple shows today so um open the discussion please like share comment get these videos out because i'm not getting as many views as i like um I'd like to have at least like, you know, a hundred or 200 video views on there. I'd love to reach more people, but, um, it's just not the way of things right now. So, um, yeah, I appreciate your guys' support and everything that you guys do for the channel. If you'd like to be a part of the channel or set me up like with an interview or have an interview on the show, have me go on another show. I'd love to do it. Um, like I said, email me at the rebel Alliance three, three, three at Gmail. Um, you can check it uh, on the about page and things like that. Uh, go ahead and check out the channel, share, like, comment, like I said, and uh, let me know if there's anything weird happening with the channel because if I go to videos, it says this uh, person has no content on their channel. And then if I go and click the videos, it actually shows up and they show up. But I've actually, like I said, I've been censored. Um, 
one of my videos about the Emerald Tablets and consciousness and the chakras is, is blocked in 246 countries. Uh, I have no idea why. And people are going from one to three because they're skipping two, and two is very essential. So I don't even want to put more effort into that until I know what's going on or when it gets back out there. Maybe I'll just have to re-upload or reshare these something um, when I get them all together. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know what you think, and uh, have a great day.